Michelle Howell joins the call and is the author of over two dozen books. Today, we will be talking about her latest book, Grace and Gratitude for Everyday Life. Michelle, welcome to the call. Thank you, Nancy, for having me. I'm so happy you're here. You are such a, a dynamic speaker and have written so many books. And this one we're talking about today is um, about grace. But Michelle, what is grace and how does God give us grace? Well, I think that scripture talks so much about the grace of God and the grace of God that lives within us once we become believers, the Holy Spirit is within us. And God's grace is um, pretty much our lifeblood on earth. He gives us strength and grace day by day. And I think we often realize how weak we are. We're not up to the challenge. We might be overwhelmed. We might be struggling. And yet Christ says, you know, my grace is sufficient for you, no matter what circumstance that you're in. And the weaker that we are, the more his grace flows through us and strengthens us. And why? The big question, why aren't we strong? Well, he wants us to be dependent upon him. He wants our lifeblood to be connected with him all the time. And if we were, as a typical American likes to be independent and self-sufficient and, you know, doing everything by pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps, we would have no need of the Lord. And I think that's one thing that I focus on in this book, Grace and Gratitude for Everyday Life, is that life is a challenge for everybody. And we all have our our sorrows and our losses and our sufferings, but yet God's grace is sufficient. And I think we have to just reframe our troubles so that we look at them through the lens of eternity. And again, doing that through a grateful heart, honing and disciplining ourselves to say, thank you, Lord, no matter what's going on, not because we're thankful for cancer, or thankful for the death of a friend or a job loss, but we're thankful that Jesus has promised to be with us in those trials and to never, never leave us. Then we say, thank you for that. Because otherwise our life would be, if we'd be lived on our own and we would be stumbling through it in our own steam and we would not get very far. Yeah. Well, um, you know, Paul tells us to be content in everything, but people are so dissatisfied is it because their lack of gratitude, you know, or even entitlement? Uh, both. I would say both in our culture. You know, I think as the years go by, those are, of us who are a little older see there is a real spirit of entitlement now with most people. And it's sad because it disconnects them from the blessings in their life. They're not content with what they've been given by the Lord. And I think one thing we have to do is, again, spend time in the word every day, renew our minds so that we know what truth is and we become keen, spiritual people who understand God's truth. And we can, um, we know truth from lies and all around us in our society, either it's movies, music, what we read, billboards, commercials, it's Satan's world right now. The Lord gave him the earth he's ruling it and he's trying to distract us he's trying to deceive us and he's doing a fantastic job and more and more people christians need to be more biblically literate so that they can see these messages read these messages be bombarded maybe by even their family members or work colleagues and say in their heart no that's not truth and i think one thing we do is, is we know more truth how do we know truth How do we know we can trust God? Again, it's simple. We open up the word of God and he shows us who he is. He shows us his character. He is sovereign. He is righteous. He is holy. He is good. He is faithful. He's forgiving. He's loving. He's also, as I said, holy, and he will be the righteous judge. I think a lot of churches are not focusing on that, that God is the whole, the whole personality is not just love and fuzzy, warm feelings. Mm -hmm. But he says, no, you need to obey me. I know what's best for you, Christian. Please obey me because I love you. Not because I'm trying to steal your joy. No, no. He wants us to have joy, peace and all that. Mm. But I think today what I'm seeing is so many women, especially don't know the word of God. And it's grievous because where do you go when you're in trouble? If you don't know, you can even trust God. And how can you trust him if you've not read his word? Because he reveals to us who he is through his word and through the life of Jesus Christ. Because they're the perfect representation of one another. Mm -hmm. So I think 
the best thing to do is spend time in God's word to know the truth and to meditate on it and to write out verses, put them on a card, put them in your phone, but carry them with you through the day so that when you're bombarded with your trials, you can go to truth. Like I will never, never, ever, ever, ever leave you or forsake you. Um, cast your anxieties onto me and I will give you peace. There's so many powerful promises that can comfort us, but we have to invest our time and our energy in knowing who God is and what he promises to be for us. Mm -hmm. And and how do you grow as a person? How do you grow if you're not in God's word? If you think you can just check into a church and just hear the great music, right? And think that that's what it is. And, you know, just get, you get a good word. You feel a little good about yourself and you leave. How is that really growing you, convicting you, making you uh, a more of a, a child of God. Right. You can't do it. And going to church on a Sunday morning it, it is essential, I think, to fellowship corporately with other believers. It's wonderful. It is that energizing boost at the beginning of our week, and we all need it. But yeah. people often stop short there, as you said. We also need to know that God's word says, he has given each one of us at least one spiritual gift. And what are we to do with those gifts? We are to use them to strengthen the body of Christ in our local fellowship. Mm -hmm. So everybody should be doing something, some kind of service gifted to their gifts and talents and abilities appropriately in their body. And then we build each other up mm -hmm. and that can take place on a Sunday morning. Sure. But it also might take place on a Wednesday morning in a small group. If you are gifted in teaching, you are building the other people up and they are, you're keeping accountability strong between you. Mm -hmm. And then you're also, like you said, we have to be in God's word daily. He says, renew your mind daily mm -hmm. because he knew we would be bombarded with the world every day, all day long. Surely as Americans, we can each take a half an hour a day to yeah. spend in, you know, God's word or whatever, something. I know we're all busy, but yeah. it is essential. Otherwise the Satan's lies and the deception of the world it creeps into our thinking and, you know, we really are what we think. Yeah. Proverbs says, as a man thinks, he becomes mm -hmm. And our thinking is powerful yeah. because I remember what Paul Tripp said. He goes, you are more influential than any other person in your life because you talk to yourself all day long into the night. No one is as influential as your own talk, self talks. So you have to be always speaking God's truth to yourself. Mm -hmm. And so, which makes me think also um, how people are not content with just not, with not just God's word, you know, by reading it every day, some people are just, you know, like I said, they go to church and they, they do their, you know, their steps mm -hmm. to the, to their week, mm -hmm. but are they, are they content with their life? The things that God has given them, are they grateful for them? How does your point, your book point to this in this direction for people? Well, I think that one thing we have to realize is we have to hone um, the mindset of looking at everything through the lens of eternity, because so much of our life is hard. We have relational impasses, perhaps with relatives or neighbors. We have struggles at our job. We will have health struggles. We may not have enough money. I mean, the list can go on and on and on of the troubles common to men and women. It's going to be there forever. We live in a broken, sinful world. However, God has promises to supply our every need, not our wants, but our needs. And I think we always have to go back to honing a thankful heart, saying, thank you, Lord. I have breath in my lungs today. Um, the sun came up today. You know what? I, I have a house to live in. I might have a car to drive. I have clothes on my back and food to eat. Most Americans have all those things. Many parts of the world, they don't. I think Americans especially were so um, materialistic minded that we, we forfeit the contentment that other, other countries, people don't have anything that we have. And yet in Christ, they are content and joyful and their spiritual walk is robust. Whereas American, American church is, I think, weakened by how much we have materially because we're so easily distracted. Mm -hmm. Instead of worshiping the creator, we worship the created, whether yeah. it's leisure, money, food, sex, whatever it is that your thing is, we displace God. 
in learning, it takes, again, time in God's word every day, praying and asking him and saying, Lord, reveal the sin in my heart. Show me if I've made idols in my heart that have replaced you. Mm. And then day by day, slowly, because change is always slow, we start walking toward him rather than walking away from him. Yeah. And he says to abide in him, right? Um, talk about the story of a woman that struggles with being cheerful. Yeah, I tell the story of a, a gal in my book who was being forced to move across the country again. And her brother looked at her and said, you always see the negative. Don't you realize that the rest of us don't want to move either? We're all suffering with this job. This job move. It was a job that the father was in the army. They moved him across the country and the girl just moaned and complained. And as her brother talked to her, really rebuked her. She went to her room and prayed and realized I'm so self-centered and selfish. Here are my parents and my brother. None of them want to go through this either, but they're all trying to be grateful and thankful and trying to uh, reframe it again into an opportunity that got his place into their lives for his sovereign purposes. And then she started to change her mind and her heart. But I, when people say, well, how do you change that kind of an attitude if you're a, a complainer or a whiner by nature? And I can be a whiner. Sometimes my husband's like, are you whining? And I'm like, no, I'm not whining. I'm not whining. <laughs> but really, but it's one thought at a time. We take our thoughts captive one thought at a time under the obedience of Christ. Mm -hmm. So if we start down the road, we have to apologize, ask forgiveness, and then reframe it again and say, Lord, you are sovereign. You are good. You love me. You only want what is good for me and which will result in your glory. So even though I don't like it, even though it's hard, I'm going to thank you that I can trust you through this. And I think that's another thing is the more that we know God's word and the longer we walk with him, we have a longer faith walk of history and we find him trustworthy at every corner, at every turn, because he is trustworthy and we want to honor him. Often my prayer when I'm in a, a fix that I don't like is to say, I don't like this Lord. Please help me to trust you. Please give me a robust faith. Give me the grace to trust you so that I can honor you because you are worthy of my trust. I don't want to dishonor you by being distrustful, but it all starts at one thought at a time. It's one thought at a time. Mm -hmm. So if someone out there is um, really struggling with getting up every day and reading the Bible and um, how do you, how do you, you know, how do you address being content with just sitting with the Lord every morning and being with him and your Bible? Well, I think it's something, it's like any new discipline we start in our life. It's always hard at first. Like if you're a person who doesn't exercise, the first three, three weeks are probably pretty tough because you're starting something that's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to hurt. You're going to be tired. You're going to be bruised. It's different, right? So you have to approach it, I think, that way too, that you're doing something long term that's going to change your life forever for good you make an appointment and i'll tell women make an appointment every morning at 9 a.m whatever your time is that you have a brief time and even put a timer on your phone and say i'm going to sit with him and read for 15 minutes and i'm going to pray for 10 and maybe i'll journal for five and journaling people will say i'm not a journaler well i'm not a journaler per se but i will write down prayer requests and i will date them and I will put Bible verses under them. And then I will go back occasionally and look and I'll see what God has done. And that's a good way to start because you build your own faith history with the Lord. And then you're surprised six months, a year later. Oh, I remember what happened a year ago and what the trouble I was in or how, how depressed I was or I was grieving over a loss. And then I will read a few sentences and I'll say, oh, see what God did see what God did. I think once you start, it becomes like a snowball. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger until you can't wait to get into God's word and have time of intimacy talking to him. Mm -hmm. So why would someone want to buy this book? Well, I will tell you why I wrote the book. 
because after the pandemic, I had a hard time being grateful. I was discovering, I was moaning in my heart about the world events and the status of the world and all the corruption and just everything felt so uncertain and so out of control that I realized, even though I've been a believer for over 50 years now, which is crazy, I needed to hone in and develop a heart that was more grateful. So writing this book helped me to spend more time in God's word, to talk to people and interview them. And I would talk to people who were in terrible, hard situations, life-threatening ones. And yet they trusted him hour by hour, day by day. And as I watched their lives transform, I thought, okay, this, this is something I need to do more of. So I wrote it for that and that reason. And I think we're all pretty much, I think, kind of fighting the same battle as far as listening to the news. If we listen to it, it's just dismal every single day. And people are so discouraged or they're anxious and nervous and uncertain. But when we hone in on God's goodness and his faithfulness and we share each other's stories, it builds up our faith. And I think that's why I wrote it. And I think the people who've read it have said, oh, I'm encouraged because if someone else went through this trial and the Lord was faithful to them, it boosts my faith and it gives me courage to walk through my own trials too. Mm, wow. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. So, um, so why, my last question is, why is it hard for people to, to love God when they go through storms in life? Well, I think it's going back to the sovereignty of God and asking the age old question. If you are sovereign and you could stop these tragedies, why don't you stop them? And then when we're in the midst of our sorrows and our grief and our suffering, you know, the Lord knows our hearts. He loves us. He knows our hearts are breaking. Jesus, fully God, fully man is the only religion in all of the world that God came to earth as a man and lived a human life so that he could experience every emotion, every bit of sorrow and suffering and temptation, but without sin, but he understands us. And I think we have to remember he's with us in it, but it is hard. I mean, when you lose someone unexpectedly, it's a grief. Mm. God knows you're going to grieve. He expects you to grieve. He wants you to grieve, but he also wants you to nestle in close to him so he can comfort you mm -hmm. and he can walk through the, you know, the, the fires with you. But again, I think we have to look at the eternal picture and it's hard when you're suffering. That's why I encourage women know who God is before you get into a trial. So that means everyone needs to start today by opening up the word of God and studying who he is, getting familiar with him and grabbing a couple verses and walking through your day with him. Because when we get into a firestorm, our emotions are so powerful. They take us under really fast. And then, but again, God is faithful and he will lift us up and he will give us what we need. But it is not unexpected, I think, for people to get upset and angry at God when they're suffering because their pain is so great. But he's a big enough God to understand that too. He is our heavenly father. And then we cry out to him for help. And then he is right there to help us. That's wonderful. Well, Michelle, where can they pick up a copy of Grace, Gratitude for Everyday Life? Well, you know, Amazon has every book on the planet. So there's always Amazon. But I, I like to recommend ChristianBook.com because it's a Christian book distributor. They only have Christian books and it just supports small businesses. So I always steer people there because their sales are fantastic. At the end of each chapter, there are takeaway action steps, prayer and practice you can use in everyday life, which is so wonderful about grace and gratitude for everyday life. I love that. I love that book. Um, so what would you like to leave my audience with today? I want everyone to know that God is faithful as I have found him to be faithful, no matter what trial you're in, no matter what you're suffering, no matter how many storms are pressing in on you. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal savior, and if you are part of the family of God, he's faithful and he will help you. But you have a part to play in that relationship. 
and your active part is to read the word. It is to meditate on his truths. It's to be in a sound Bible-believing church where you have fellowship with like-minded believers who will help you and encourage you and spur you on as you will them. But, you know, we God does everything perfectly, but he expects us to give our all, you know, as far as following him, to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and realize that the hardships of the Christian life Christ talked about, but he also said, I have overcome the world. Yes, you will face tribulation and troubles in the world, but I have overcome the world. And I think you just want to remember that, that no matter what happens today or tomorrow in the future, Christ is our overcoming Savior and he will be with us. In Ephesians 2.8, Paul tells us, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God. God gives us grace, even though we don't deserve it. Do you extend grace to others and show gratitude to God for all the gifts he has given to you every day that you don't see? Well, are you seeking the call of God in your life? Because God speaks to you every day. Are you listening to the call? Oh.